Grüezi YouTubers. Here is the guy with the Swiss accent again. In the first video about the NRF 24L01 modules, we were able to establish a physical connection between the two modules on the 2.4 GHz band. If you missed this episode, it might be good to view part 1 first. In this video, we will concentrate on the software part. How to make the connection reliable, how to pack our data in a simple and efficient way, and of course, how to establish the bidirectional data transfer. At the end, we will have two working NRF24 L01 nodes, which are able to transport commands in one direction and receive telemetry data in the other. To create telemetry data, I use a TCS3200 color sensor. This is by far not an ideal color sensor because all three sensors also measure infrared light. This effect makes that the measured values of all three colors will change even if I change only one color of the NeoPixels. But for today, I just use it to create some telemetry data and to prove that the overall system works. But let's now continue with communication. We saw in the first video that wireless communication easily can be disturbed by other devices or noise on the same frequency. Because this is unavoidable, we have to build our devices that they can cope with this situation. Already in the early days of Morse communication, the operators established a procedure to solve this problem. The sending operator sent a few words and stopped. The receiving operator decided whether the content of the message he heard was correct. If so, he sent a short acknowledge signal back to the sending operator. If the frequency was noisy, the receiving person would not hear the message or not correctly. Then he would not acknowledge it and the sender, after a short time, repeated the same message again. It could also happen that the message was received correctly, but the acknowledge signal was somehow disturbed. This had the same effect on the sender. He had no acknowledge and had to repeat the message again. In these days, the messages were usually clear text and the receiver was able to judge whether the content was OK or not. But of course only if he spoke the language of the transmitted message. In my case, this was definitely not true when I had to transmit Arabic names of refugees from Damascus to Geneva during the Lebanon War in 1982. And today the sender for sure cannot judge whether the message is right or wrong. This is why checksums were invented. At the end of each message, a unique checksum is added to the message. Because the receiver knows how this checksum was calculated, he can check if either the message or the checksum was correctly received. These principles are implemented in the NRF24L01 chip. If you enable this function, the sender adds a checksum and the receiver acknowledges the correct reception of the message back to the sender. If the sender gets this acknowledge, it continues with sending the next package. If not, it repeats the same package till it gets the acknowledge. After a certain number of retries, it stops and informs the sketch about the failure. All this is done without your intervention by the chips itself. Pretty neat. You can even set the maximal numbers of retries. Here we use 15. If we do not use this function, data can be lost on the way from the sender to the receiver and we do not know about it. 
So now we have a reliable connection between our two devices. In the next step we have to find a way to package our data to a format which can be transported by the NRF chips. The maximum package size between two NRF24L01 chips is 32 bytes. This means it could, for example, transfer the sentence the quick brown fox in one package because the sentence consists of 19 ASCII characters. However, it could not transfer the sentence the quick brown fox jumps over a lazy dog because this sentence has 42 bytes and is too long. If you want to transfer this sentence, you have to divide it into two parts. This is not done by the chips. For our example today, we only need to transfer three integer readings of the potentiometers in one and three floating point readouts of the TCS3200 into the other direction. So we have to package these numbers into the 32 byte data package. In order to keep it simple and stupid, I use data structures. A structure is a simple but very powerful thing in the Arduino IDE. As we saw before, the data structure in one direction is called control pack and in the reverse direction the data is packaged in a structure called display pack. First you have to define the content of these structures. Let's use the control pack structure as an example. The structure has to carry the integer values of the readings of A0, A1 and A2. So we define the structure control def in a first step. And in the next step we have to define the variable control pack using the newly created type. This statement looks exactly the same as if you would define a variable as integer. The only difference is that the type integer is predefined in the Arduino language. A structure is stored in memory as consecutive bytes. If we want to transfer it over our communication channel, we just have to provide the memory address of the first byte of the structure and its length to the sending routine. Addresses in Arduino language are identified by an ampersand. Our structures are much smaller than the 32 byte maximum and we would have plenty of room for other data. To add data, just include its definition and name in the structure and the rest is taken care by the IDE and the NRF chips. Again, very neat. Just for information, a NRF24L01 chip can receive data from six different senders at the same time. Each pipe has to have a different address, of course. And keep in mind, all these devices have to operate on the same channel. Now we have everything to establish a reliable connection and can move on to the sketch. In this example, I use the same sketch for both Arduinos. Each Arduino gets its role by reading an input pin during setup. If this pin is high, the module executes the role potentiometer and if it's low, it executes the role NeoPixel. A simple jumper is used to select the role. The sketch starts with the initialization of the RF24 and the NeoPixel objects and with the definition of the two pipe addresses. In the setup we start the NRF module with the command radio.begin and open the two pipes according to the assigned roles and set all the different parameters we discussed above. The statement radio.printdetails sends the actual configuration to the serial monitor. Here we can check if all the prerequisites 
like channels and transmission speeds are the same for the sender and the receiver. Very important for debugging. Then we set the devices in the listening mode, which is default. Only if we send something, we change the mode for a short period, because we do not want to block the channel more than necessary. In the loop part of the sketch, we decide on the role we execute. The role potentiometer reads the potentiometers and puts them into the control pack structure. This is done with the statement control pack dot a0 equals analog read of a0. After that, we send the structure to the receiving station and wait for the acknowledge. If we do not get it even after 15 retries, we know that the communication was not successful. In our case, we do not care and continue anyway with listening to the response from the opposite side. If a display pack arrived and is available, we read it and update the statistics on the serial monitor. If we have to wait too long, we know that the communication was not successful and increase the error count. If we are in the role NeoPixel, we check if a control pack is available and if so, we read it and display its values through the NeoPixels. If not, we read the color values with the TCS3200 and transmit it. Let's now check the system. I have the NeoPixels put on the floor and the potentiometers on my table. If I turn the potentiometers, the color of the NeoPixels change. Success! And the values returned from the color sensors also change. Success again! Let's now look at the success statistics. It shows how many of the last 10 transmissions were successful. With this setup, you can now start your own tests. I moved one of the devices into another room upstairs, just to show you how important such tests are. If I leave the NRF module alone, the transmission is not working at all. All 10 packets are lost, all the time. If I take the NRF module and move it just a few centimeters, the success rate is 100% and the communication works perfectly. This is because we work with microwaves and the wavelength is only a few centimeters. You can get the NRF24L01 chips on modules with a power amplifier and longer antennas. Because they are pin and software compatible, you can just replace the modules and check the performance. If I only change one transceiver, it does not help a lot. Only if I change both, the communication works. If you are interested in radio frequencies, you even can add lambda quarter ground planes or build a dipole antenna to increase performance of your devices. But this is a whole other story. I hope this episode was useful or at least interesting for you. Bye.